Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. My purpose is to help you get free from the emotional baggage that weighs you down so that you can be fully alive and engaged in life. My media includes audiobooks, self-help books, videos, and this podcast. Just a reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. Now here's today's episode. I learned to appease and people please. And at some point you begin to lose your own identity because you're not allowed to have your own identity as, um, you know, a, a person. So that's really what I faced growing up. Welcome to this week's episode of Life Without Baggage. I'm Dr. Tony Cooper, and I have a guest with me today, Julie Raboa. Welcome today, Julie. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm happy to share today. So today we're going to go into people-pleasing, and Julie is going to share about her background, how she unlearned it, and what she does now. So first I'm going to read your intro, Julie. Julie is a survivor of childhood trauma that resulted from a parent's undiagnosed mental illness, which wasn't identified until Julie was in her mid-20s. As a result, she experienced emotional abuse, neglect, parental divorce, and poverty. Statistics predicted that Julie's future was bleak, but an encounter with the Holy Spirit dramatically shifted the trajectory of her life. Because Julie has the powerful combination of lived experience, education, and strong Christian faith, she's uniquely positioned to help you overcome inner pain and reach your God-given potential. Her mission is to equip, inspire, and transform lives through faith-based mental health and wellness strategies. She does this through speaking engagements and her podcast called Room to Bloom. So thanks for joining us, Julie. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here and to share a little bit about my background and how I overcame some of the challenges that I faced as a child who grew up in a very unstable household due to a parent's undiagnosed mental illness. I think a lot of people are going to be able to relate to a lot of different things about your story. So How did you become a people pleaser? Well, you know, that stemmed from my mother's mental illness and also because of the way that my stepfather encouraged me to interact with my mom. And that was through people pleasing. Um, So my mom has um, a mental health issue called borderline personality disorder, which I know many people haven't heard about. But, you know, I experienced a very controlling um relationship with my mom, uh, very manipulative. Um, She had very black and white thinking and thought in absolutes. So something was either good or it was bad. And that included people in her life. Uh, And often I was characterized as bad when I spoke up on my own behalf or disagreed. I would be accused of being abusive towards her. Uh, She was very jealous And so I really had to learn to monitor what I shared with her as far as what was happening in my life, because even something seeming very innocent and innocuous would at some point later be used against me in order to um, get me to do things that she wanted. And so if you didn't buy into her way of thinking or the way she wanted to do things, um, it was just very challenging. She would either erupt in rage, she would mope for days and wouldn't shower um, and really try to lay the guilt on. And so my stepfather played into this um, because he would say things like, look at what you're doing to your mother. You need to apologize. You need to make this right. Um, 
you know, you know how she is, just say sorry and let's move on with life. And so I learned to appease and people please. And at some point you begin to lose your own identity because you're not allowed to have your own identity as, um, you know, a, a person. So that's really what I faced growing up. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how did your stepfather play into that? So he encouraged, we're just going to adjust, we're just going to adjust, we're just going to adjust. Yeah. And were you raised to believe in God or is that something that developed later? So initially when my mother and father were married, um, I believe they met at some sort of Jesus revolution event in the, uh -huh. in the 70s after my father returned from Vietnam. He was a veteran um, and he uh, promised God he was going to serve him with his life if he made it through the war. And so he became a pastor of, at a small church. And my mom actually was the pastor's wife and she played piano um, for the hymns during the service. Um, however, I do believe that my mother's undiagnosed mental illness caused a lot of strain in their marriage. And so when I was two, they divorced. Somewhere along the lines, um, my mother lost her faith and she actually began initially exploring Messianic Judaism and then converted to Judaism with my stepfather when I was 12. And so since my mother had primary custody, uh, I had to attend synagogue um, you know, Friday nights or Saturday mornings, as well as attend Hebrew school with and Jewish day camp in the summer with other uh, children my age. I want to make, make sure I understand this. So you were raised kind of like non-denominational Christianity, which is how a lot of people are. And then you shifted around age 12 to fitting into your mom's new religion, which was Judaism. Yes. And at that point, when I was young, when this started happening, when I was 11, 12, I was really still trying to hold on to my Christian faith. And so I would hop on the yellow Awana school bus every Wednesday, trying to get myself to church. And my mom also dealt with depression. And so at that point in time, there were days where I just wouldn't see her. She'd come home from work and would get in bed. And so there really wasn't opposition for me to hop on that Awana bus. I'm sorry. Some people might might not know what Awana is. It's like Sunday school. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's like an evangelical um, group for children and through teenage um, years where it's like, you get to sing songs and they have fun events and you learn about God, you learn Bible verses. Um, so they really make it fun for kids. Uh, and it's like a club on, uh, for my church, it was at Wednesdays, um, but a neighbor invited me. And so I just hopped on to that bus and went with other neighborhood uh, kids to Awana. So that was what was helping you kind of stay somewhat grounded through all this chaos. Yes. As okay. well as my father, who was very upset that my mother had um, converted to Judaism in the Reformed tradition. And so on one hand, I've got, you know, a dad saying, hey, you know, you still believe in Jesus, right? Because uh, if you don't, you're going to go to hell. And mm -hmm. then I've got a mom saying, well, now, if you worship Jesus, that's idol worship. And so if you do that, you're going to go to hell. And so it was a really confusing time for me as a, an 11, 12 year old. Um, and being that I was young, I didn't really have a choice whether or not to attend synagogue. And so my mom wanted, she really applied pressure throughout the years for me to convert. And so part of that people pleasing was when I was 18, her story changed. You know, at first it was, I just want you to be exposed so that you can make an educated decision to, well, you're 18 now and you're allowed to convert and you need to do so for the sake of this family. And so I did. That's how extreme the people pleasing was that I actually went through the conversion process, not because that's what I wanted, but because I knew it would mitigate the household chaos for a period of time. Okay. So that wasn't what was in your heart. It was what you felt like you had to do to keep the rage under control. Yes. Okay. 
What were there other things that you found yourself doing to keep peace in the home? Well, just just apologizing, you know, when I was encouraged to do so and it re- and taking the blame for uh, the difficulties that we had in our mother-daughter relationship because, um, you know, my mother and my stepfather, you know, they were united and you're the one who's selfish. You're the one who is difficult. You're the one causing problems. And so you you don't have anybody safe who you can turn to who can objectively see the situation. And so, yeah, I accepted the blame and I, and I was the one to apologize continually. So how did you get to the point where you decided you needed to stop yielding to the control? Well, for, there was, there are two things. One is my now husband, we were dating at the time and actually he was a psychology undergraduate and he said, I think your mom has a personality disorder. And I said, what is that? I had never heard of it before. I'm in my twenties. And so he, you know, told me a little bit about that. And he says, you need to use some boundaries. And I had never even heard of boundaries before. I mean, they were pretty non-existent in my home. And so I began to learn a little bit more about that. And then second, I was 21 years old and I was a college student living at home and I was miserable, Um, you know, because when I converted, I knew it wasn't the right decision for me, but I did it to appease her and I was miserable. So I'm crying on the floor asking God, when was I happy? Have I ever been happy? Like I couldn't even remember a time when I had joy in my life. And in that moment, I was washed over with that peace that transcends understanding that the Bible talks about. And I knew in my heart that I would be okay, even though I didn't know how. And I had a a little vision in my mind of myself as a little girl sitting on a church pew. And so then I knew, okay, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I didn't know how I would be okay, but I trusted that God loved me and that he had a better future in store for me. And so then I started taking myself to church. So I'm 21, I'm living at home, I'm walking down the stairs, taking myself to church all by myself. And it made my mother very unhappy, made our relationship even more tense. She's saying things like, you're tearing this family apart. How could you do this? Um, and so on. So, but that began the journey of my of my faith and some independence, you know, as a as a young adult. So the Lord actually spoke to you through sort of an image. Mm-hmm. And a feeling. Okay. So he can speak to us in a lot of different ways, but you were sincere that you wanted some direction and the Lord answered you. So that took a lot of courage to start to make, make a shift. What, what else happened to help you get free? Well, I would say the more that I was able to gain some distance from my family relationships, um, whether that was at college through my friends and watching interactions with their parents and their family. Uh, I got married at 23. So then I gained even a little bit more distance because now I'm not living at home anymore. I really began to see that um, this isn't how all families interact. This isn't how all mothers and daughters um how their relationships are. Wow. Some actually enjoy being together. Some Mm -hmm. actually want to go to the movies together and have lunch together and they're pleasant to each other. It's not just accusations and jealousy and guilt trips. And so then I really began to see, yeah, I'm not sure that what all the blame that was laid on me was my responsibility. And so even though I didn't understand what borderline personality disorder was, I began to see that there's some kind of mental health issue going on here that I don't have the power to resolve. Yeah. So personality disorders, just to give a little bit of information to the listener. So uh, you can't diagnose a person, but 
I can. So, (laughs) 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 but a personality disorder, it's a very rigid approach to life. And it's a, it's kind of like, it just slops over into everything. So when a person has a personality disorder, we all have flaws, but it's, it's like there are so many blinders that they will repeat the same pattern over and over and over and over. They don't learn anything and they don't receive input. So when the spouse, like your stepdad, just agrees, there's no pressure for her to change. So all the pressure goes to you. Yes. So how did you start to be able to shift of letting the Holy Spirit direct you as opposed to your mom control you? Well, it, I would say it's a gradual process because the thing that I struggled with the most was the commandment to honor your mother and your father. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so when you're raised that, if you disagree with your parent, now you're dishonoring. If you have your own opinion, now you're dishonoring. If you don't do everything that they say in the way that they want you to, now you're dishonoring. And so it's trying to unlearn you know, that message and what God wants for you as a unique individual because and here's a scripture that really helped it was galatians 1 10 am i now seeking the approval of man or of god if i were still trying to please man i would not be a servant of christ and so that really tells us that our priority needs to be god before people even if their parents um you know, who are trying to control and dictate, you know, you as an adult. And so that really helped me to shift my thinking. God has to come absolutely first. And then there was another scripture, uh, Matthew 10, 37 through 39, where it says, whoever loves a father or mother and also a son or daughter um, more than God is not worthy of God. And so again, here we are with prioritization, God first. And then also the commandments, the first three commandments um, have to do with our relationship with God first, and then the rest have to do with our relationship with others. And so God has to be first. Yeah, I find this is a huge struggle for people that they feel guilty if they start to distance, set a boundary, and many times they don't even recognize that you're allowing this person to control you. How would you help people distinguish what is honoring and what is control? Well, honor really means to respect and treat with respect. So speaking kindly, being helpful when it's in my power and ability to do so, um, and being grateful for the positive things that they've contributed to our lives. But what it is not is allowing someone to control what you do or how you think. Um, You know, for example, my mother would say, she'd try to interfere in our our married finances. Um, You don't make good decisions, Uh, you know, trying to make me feel like I wasn't capable so that she could then step in. Where, you know, when you're married, that's between your the husband and the wife. And so even if you're a single or you're married, the relationship needs to change when you become an adult. So God's got his own plans and purposes for people. And so if someone's wanting you to meet a need that they're capable of fulfilling themselves or that they really need to be relying on God for, that's an indication of a boundary that might need to be there. Yeah, I, I find that um, it, this comes up a lot and you have to ask yourself, what will happen if I don't do what this person wants? If they're going to freak out, if they're going to cut you off, then you're probably motivated by fear, not by respect. So you have to kind of wrestle with that. And many people have not given up trying to get that approval from a dysfunctional parent. And I mean, I tell people, if you don't have it by now, it's not coming, you know? It's like, you need to respect yourself. So, I mean, I sort of make a joke about it, but it's it's really not a joke. It's like, if if you do not have your parents' approval, 
then there's something wrong with the parent. Because even on your bad days, it's like a parent should love you. Yes. And withheld approval, in my experience, has always had an underlying motivation of control and manipulation. And so, you know, when we look to God for approval, his approval is what matters most because humans often have, you know, motivations that benefit them and not us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when you're talking about boundaries and people freaking out or cutting you off, that's often an indication of a boundary that probably should have been there a long time ago, because when people are used to there not being any boundaries, they will push back when you start to establish some. Yeah, especially unhealthy p- people. A healthy person, if you say, wow, I'm sorry, I can't do that. They're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And an unhealthy person will pressure you. Why can't you? Don't you know how much this matters to me? you know, you're tearing the family apart. You get blame, 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 and pressure. So yeah, it's it's hard to hear the Lord's direction if a person is screaming at us emotionally. It's very hard. So it's pretty impressive that you were able to establish yourself as a separate adult. It took a while. And even with the boundaries, you know, my husband is now a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, So I had a lot of support in that area. Um, But even with the boundaries that he and I would set, they were constantly tested. And, you know, situations arose where it became unsafe for my children to continue to be in relationship. And so sometimes you do have to set, you know, boundaries when that person chooses not to accept responsibility for their own well-being and how they affect others. Those are hard decisions. Most of the time people can find a way if they stick to their boundaries Sometimes people get tired of testing them if you don't change, you know, but others, they're, they're going to take it to the mat. So uh, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Are there any other practical suggestions you have for people who know that they need to set better boundaries with a parent or an adult child or um, maybe even a spouse? Are there any other suggestions you have? Well, you know, the Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, which means it's okay to say yes if you feel led to um, and you really want to, and it's okay to say no and to prioritize your your family, your own mental health and well-being, and the priorities that God has for you in your life, because you weren't put here by accident. You weren't put here to cater and serve somebody who is able to do that for themselves. And so I would encourage people to practice boundaries um, and really seek an identity in Christ. Because when we know that we are precious and valued children of God, then it's a lot easier to say yes to God and to say no to things that are pulling us away from God or what he wants for our lives. How can people learn more about you or about your work? Well, I have a podcast called Room to Bloom, and all we talk about is how to overcome um, different challenges that people face as adults who want to overcome childhood trauma. So I interview mental health professionals such as yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, authors with incredible stories of surviving, pastors, and uh, coaches. So that's a great resource. It's called Room to Bloom. Or on my website, From Bud to Bloom, I have some articles there, and I also have some coaching programs available to help people uh, get them started in the right direction. Thanks so much for sharing with us, Julie. And I will put links in the show notes so that people can find you easily and um, maybe visit your podcast. You have a lot of really good information. Thanks so much for having me, Tony. I appreciate it. Well, God bless everyone. There is hope. I want to invite you to leave me a voicemail to say how you have dropped some baggage. Now, the link I'm going to put in the show notes, you can leave me a 90-second message 
on how you dropped baggage based on maybe something you learned in the podcast or a prayer that we had in the podcast or some other bit of information or suggestion that you found useful. And then I plan on sharing this in a future segment where I include the messages that people have left. So if that's something you would like to do, I would love to hear from you. And let me know whether it's okay to share it. Thanks for listening. And if this helped you, share it with a friend. Talk to you next time.